Titus chapter 2, and um, we left off, remember, Paul leaves Titus, a, a young pastor, not as young as Timothy, but probably anywhere like in his mid-30s, maybe even upwards as 40, as old as 40, but he leaves him in Crete to set things in order. There was a church there planted in Crete off the coast of, you know, Greece, little island, and um, they were having some troubles. They were having some difficulties because the converts there, the Cretans, they were a, a difficult group of people. They were a very hard-to-contain group of people, hard to mold and make them like Jesus Christ because they grew up in an area. It was a very rough part of town, so to speak, and a lot of them came in as thieves and extortioners, and the Roman government even had big issues with the Cretans. So a lot of this started to infiltrate the church because people weren't surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ. They weren't giving their lives to the Lord. They were kind of still living the same way they did before they knew Christ. And that's unacceptable. And Paul writes to them, and the first thing he tells Titus is, Titus, get some help. If there's any godly men around you, Get them, ordain them, set them up, up alongside you to set these things in order. And then after that, he goes, what you teach and what you believe should overflow in the way that you live. So Titus, if you're really teaching sound doctrine, you need to keep putting it forth, keep putting it out there, and keep telling people, listen, if you believe this, and if you say Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and then remember, he addresses the older men, the older women, the younger men, and the younger women. He goes, older men. He goes, you guys need to be the example. And, and, and you guys need to teach the young men to live godly and sober lives. And he goes, older women, old, older ladies in the church, but older in life and older in the Lord. You ladies need to teach the younger women to, this is how you need to live for Jesus Christ in your homes and in your families and out there in the world. Because I said this before. What we believe should show forth in how we live outside these walls. And so often it does not. Again, not, there's nothing new under the sun. The same problems the New Testament church was having back then is the same problems we have today. Just the only difference of what we do today is we start whole other movements and whole other churches to dumb down the word of God to say this is what God's word really says to make provision to do with you know, what we want to do. That's the difference today. Back then, there were these few churches that Paul started, that Paul set up passes in, and he would keep writing back to them to say, no, get this right, do this, you can't do that, live for Jesus, he died for you, what are you going to do? Make a difference. What we do today is, hey, you know what, we don't want to live according to the word of God, so we'll just make pretend we are, and we'll start a whole nother church, a whole nother movement, and dumb down what God's word really says. I pray that this place never does that. I pray that if we ever go that way, and if it's because of me, that God kills me and takes me out first. And I'm dead serious. Now, what he's going to get into this week is the grace of God. What I'm going to talk about this week is when the grace of God really comes into our life, what does it produce? What does it do? Because, you know, we hear things all the time. You know, we're not under law, we're under grace. We don't have to do anything anymore because we know Jesus. We're under grace. We're not under law. Well, if you really study your Bible, if you really study the New Testament, when you receive Jesus Christ and that grace appears in your life and you know how much God loves you and G that Jesus died for you, God loves you so much that he gave his only son for you to give you eternal life. But he loves you so much more that he won't leave you in the sinful state that you're in. That he wants to do a work in your life. He wants you to make changes by the power of his Holy Spirit. He wants you to make a difference for time and for eternity. And, and Paul's going to get into that as we dig into chapter 2. Now listen, we got to get it out of our heads, you know. Well, I received Jesus, and because I received Jesus, I'm set free, and I can do whatever I want. No, no, no. The Bible's clear that you're either a slave to God or you're a slave to sin. That you're a slave to righteousness or you're a slave to sin. There's no in-between in the Bible. There's not. Now, sometimes we live in between. Sometimes we live in one, you know, one foot in the world and you know, one foot in the church. We live that way, but according to God's word, 
You're either a slave to this or you're a slave to that. You're either living for Jesus or you're living for yourself in the sinful world. There's no in-between. And listen, when we read the scriptures, when we take the Bible, when we hear the word of God, or we take the word in our private time and we read it, we should read it like a mirror, the Bible says. Meaning that, Lord, where aren't I lining up? Oh man, I'm not lining up there. I'm not lining up there. Lord, forgive me. Lord, strengthen me. I don't want to be that man or, or that woman anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. Help me, God. Empower me by your Holy Spirit. That's the way we should read the Bible. In the things that, that we are doing, Lord, but by your grace, I wouldn't even be doing this. But by your grace, I wouldn't even have went to church today. But by your grace, I, you know, there's no way I would have forgiven that person or said this and done that. Because we really can't take credit for anything. Pick it up, chapter 2. After he teaches them, he tells Titus to ordain, get some leadership, and then teach sound doctrine to live what you believe. Then he's going to talk about the grace of God, verse 11, chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, or present age, some translations say. Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, he tells us three things about the grace of God. He says, first of all, the grace of God hath appeared. He's saying it from past tense. He says, because Jesus already came for us. Even in this day and age, this, this book's probably written about 30 years later from the time of Christ, maybe a little bit more, because Paul was in prison writing this book. Jesus came. Jesus came for you, he says. Jesus came for us. Grace sent Jesus to the cross. God gave us what we did not deserve. And then he says, now in the present, how are we living? And in the future, are we looking forward to his coming? Very sim simple three-point sermon there. The past, what grace has done. The present, how we live in now. In the future, are we looking forward for Jesus' return? Because when grace appears, we remember when grace comes into our lives, we reflect and we think, Lord, you came, you died for me, you loved me that much? Personally. Look what he says. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. He says all men are savable. All men are savable, but all men will not be saved, sadly enough. All men are savable, but all men will not be saved. The grace of God hath appeared to all men. That's why, listen, somebody told me about Jesus Christ. Somebody told you about Jesus Christ. Whether you heard about him on the radio, from a friend, from a pastor, from a pulpit, wherever it was, somebody told you about Jesus Christ from a parent. And then you realize, you know what, Lord, I'm going to die one day. Where am I going? Where am I going? But you heard an old, old story about God loving the world so much that he said, you know what? No human beings can reach heaven. No one can get there by their own works and by trying to be good and letting their good works outweigh their bad. But you know what? I love them anyway. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take it on me, he said. And he, God sends his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh, though not a, though not a sinner, to go to a cross and pay for your sins. And then you say, well, what do I have to do to get that? Do I have to pay for it? No. What do you do to work the works of God? You believe in him whom he has sent. Oh, you know what? I don't have to earn it. I don't have to do any of that. I just have to receive that grace and just say thank you, repent of my sin, and give my life to Jesus Christ. No problem. I'll take that. But sadly enough, even though the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, so many people say, well, you know what? I'm not going to get into that. That's extremism. You mean God wants to have, a, like, God talks to you? You ever get that one? You mean God talks to you? What's this personal relationship thing you're talking about? They think you're, like, you're nuts when you talk like that. You have a personal relationship with Jesus? You mean, like, he talks to you? You talk to him? Like, yeah. Really? <laughs> What does that sound like? Is he speaking in Hebrew? I don't know. 
By the way, I think in heaven we'll be speaking Hebrew, but I don't know. I, I'm, I could be wrong on that. But that's what grace does for you. God sent Jesus Christ to a cross to die for your sins before you were even born. He knew you. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, He chose you before the world began. He loved you before you loved Him. He sent His Son for you, and He sent His Son for all of sinful man. And I think about it, and listen, you know what? I, I heard there were like, there were 6,000 people up at, um, at Soul Fest. And that's awesome. Praise the Lord. And when I heard that, instantly I said, wow, praise the Lord. 6,000 Christians on the Northeast got together and went, you know, went up to worship God together. And I think that's so awesome. But then I'm thinking, man, if you had some old, outdated artist from the 80s, right, with some foolish hairdo, maybe not like mine, maybe worse, but there'd be, there'd be 15, 20,000 people there from some artists from the 80s way back in the day. And I'm thinking, how sad how many people don't know Jesus Christ. How sad how many people have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. How sad how many people go into churches that have crosses on them and symbols and everything else in this whole area and have never heard the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Never. You say, well, Pastor Matt, there's churches everywhere. Everyone knows about Jesus. No, but they never heard the gospel. You might know about Jesus. You might have heard about him. You might have heard about him. Yeah, that God came in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin. They might have heard all that, but they've never heard the gospel. The simple gospel is that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day to prove it to us according to the scriptures. And that repentance and faith need to be preached in his name. That's the simple gospel. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. He died for me. Come into my life. Give me eternal life, please, God. And you know how many people have never heard that? In this area? In this country? Sad. And that's why God leaves us here. That's why God leaves us here. You say, Pastor Man, well, how does that work in my life? What do I do? Am I supposed to just go around just preaching that all the time? No, you just look for opportunities, though. And sometimes it's, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Sometimes it's, hey, why don't you take this and read this? Sometimes you just get into a relationship with a person, and God gives you the open door to give them the gospel that you have. But listen, we are called to make a difference on the culture around us, not for the culture to make a difference on us. And that's what was happening in Crete a little bit. People were coming with saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and it was difficult. It was hard. There were some difficult personalities in the church, and they were just letting sin go in the church. They weren't doing anything about it. But listen, when the grace of God comes into your life, you remember, and you think back, wow, God, you love me this much that you sent your only begotten son for me. Look what he says about the present. Teaching us. So what does grace do? Grace forgives, right? All sin. It has appeared to all men. But what does it do for us right now in the present? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He goes, well, there's some don't do's because grace came in. Came in and there's some do's, he says. Because grace came into our lives, there's some things we should not do. And because grace came into our lives, there's some things we should do. Okay? You say, well, Pastor Matt, that sounds like it depends on us. That sounds like, well, because Jesus died for us and he gave us grace, he forgave us of, of all our sins, now we have to do something? Well, listen. Grace not only forgives you, but it empowers you. And that's what you don't hear in a lot of pulpits. You like people like, oh, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. But whoa, 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 what about I'm empowered, I'm empowered, I'm empowered, I'm empowered, I'm empowered. I don't know if those equaled out, but you get it. But grace empowers you to not do some things. And grace empowers you to do some things. You're not earning your salvation. That was given to you of grace. You just believed in Jesus. You gave him your life. But look at what does grace do for you? Look at 
teaching us, it teaches us, it instructs us, it tutors us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should deny ungodliness and worldly lust. I'm going through 1 John in the 11 o'clock service. And, and, and the Scriptures talk about that. We have an unction. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. So we know the truth and we can understand the truth. Now listen, that means you know as Christians, without me having to get up here and tell you, you can discern what's of God and what's not. You say, well, Pastor Matt, why do you have to get up here and tell us? You know why? Because we don't do it all the time. See, we need to remind one another. The whole New Testament is remind them. That's why look at chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind. Remind them. I need to be reminded. You need to be reminded. Ungodliness. Ungodliness. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Now, do I have to get out and list all the ungodliness? Talk about it. Well, you know, Paul did to the Galatian church. What's ungodliness? The works of the flesh, right? Thievery, extortion. Moral sins, homosexuality, fornication. We should deny those things. We should deny those things. And we should say, God, you know what? Forgive me. I don't want to do them anymore. I don't want to walk in those things anymore. We should deny those things. Listen, and if you have trouble denying those things, you should get somebody that loves Jesus that will hold you accountable. That can be private between you and them. You know what? That's what pastors and leaders and godly men and women are there for. To, to exhort you, to push you closer to Jesus Christ. You should deny those things. But listen, this is what happens. We get desensitized. You ever notice that? We get desensitized. We'll start to deny them in our lives, and it'll make a difference in our lives, but then we just like tolerate it in the culture. We tolerate it in our homes and on our TVs and on our computers. and all. We just tolerate the ungodliness. And listen, I'm preaching to myself here. It's just so out there. We're just so used to it. And sometimes I'll need a rebuke from the little ones. Now listen, I'm telling you the truth. I'll need a rebuke. Because I just get so used to it. And I'll give you a personal example. I, I get on YouTube, and I like to watch great, <laughs> greatest falls compilations. You ever do that? People just being idiots, like swinging off things, falling, trying to jump from this roof to that roof, and missing and falling. It's just, I know I get a, I get a kick out of people's misery. I, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's funny. So then I go from there, but then you know how you got the side tab going down the side, and you know, your eye glances over there. And then it was um, 17 of the greatest uh, streakers. We're going to have to cut this off the radio, all right? <laughs> so, so, then you, so then I click over there, and the people running across the football fields, and then you know, it's, it's just, now again, everything's, you know, blurred out. You can't see nothing, but you can tell that they're naked. And again, I'm not being tempted or anything. I'm not being swayed in my mind. But then my daughter comes in. She looks at me. Dad, they're naked. That's crazy. And I'm like, well, well they're really not naked. It's blurted out and this and that. No, because I'm taking pleasure in people's idiocy and ungodliness. Does that make sense? I'm take so it went from people falling on their head to people running across the football field naked. So I said, you can't do that, Pastor. You're a pastor. Now no one's coming back. I know. <laughs> but... You know, you know what it says in Romans 1, though? It, 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 Paul sends a rebuke to those who take pleasure in those, in, in those ungodly things. So when I preach to you, I'm preaching to myself. And out of the mouth of babes, I needed to be rebuked. Because we should deny ungodliness. And it says, deny worldly lust. Worldly lust. What's a worldly lust? Think about it. It's everything. What can I get right now? What can I have me? It's everything that the world lives for. Listen, you don't think I get tempted and tried into this all the time? I'm at, you know, my son plays football and I'm at a, a, a coach's meeting and, and, you know, 
I, I call it, they're living like Thanksgiving. That's what I say. They're living like Thanksgiving. They have these massive homes in these nice areas. They got their businesses to a place. They only have to work 10, 15 hours. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm just scraping by here. This is, this, is, this is difficult. This is hot. I'm like, I wish I could just have what they have. It would be so much easier for me if I could just have what they have. Now, again, God gives some Christians something, something, some. Most of us, he don't. But that's a worldly lust. Worldly lust. I was at this, this guy's house. Nice guy. Good people. Not saved. He owned a beautiful home in Middleton, up the street from, from my home. About five times the amount, though. And I'm like, wow, this is a nice home. You're doing good here. He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm selling this home. I'm building a new home in this area of Middleton, these new houses they're building. I said, oh, good. I'm like, why are you moving? And I'm like, oh, I just want to build my dream home. I'm like, wow, that's cool. That's awesome. Then I'm like, wow, this is a pretty good dream home here. <laughs> I'm like, how much more can you dream? I mean, this is a big dream. But I guess it, it never stops, though. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. But if you're not careful, you, there's a worldly loss. Worldly lust. And what we fall into as Christians is if God, if we had this or if we had that, then our lives would be so much easier and we'd be able to serve you more and we'd be able to love you more. If you gave me this or gave me that or did this for me or did that for me, then I could do more for you, Lord. And so, so often we live our lives like that for so long and we waste opportunities to do things for Jesus. We're supposed to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Because I'm thinking, I'll think about it. <laughs> but the Bible talks about whose things will those things be when Jesus comes or when they die. It's rubbish. It's worthless. Only what we do for Jesus matters. Only what we do for Jesus lasts. And you know what? God always has to get us back to that perspective. He always has to get us back to that simple place. Simple place. You know what? Jesus loved me. His grace. He died for me. And you know what? So much more grace that I can live for him. And, and it doesn't really matter how much I have or don't have. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, that what I do matters and counts forever. See, that's what grace should do for us. It not only forgives us of all our past sins and our future sins, it empowers us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should be able to see through all the garbage around us. We should be able to see through that and live on a higher plane. Look what it says. So grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. It also teaches us to do some things. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world or present age. Soberly, that means seriously. That means that Christian, it's not only you can't clown around, you can't have fun, and it can't, it's not like, you know, oh, I don't want to be a Christian because then you can't have fun anymore. I don't want to be a Christian because things are just miserable now. I don't want to be a Christian because I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do that. No, that, that's not what it's about. It's talking about living seriously. It, it's about taking your walk with Christ seriously. It, it's about, you know what, making right choices and discerning right things for Jesus Christ, thinking on things that are holy and godly and virtuous, like Philippians 4 says, because what you do matters now. What you do counts now. And living for Jesus Christ matters. Listen. Soberly, seriously, 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 I'm sorry. That's what soberly means. Righteously and godly in this present world. We should live godly li lives. We should, we should read the word of God and say, you know what, Lord? These areas of my life are not righteous. are not lining up with you. I want them to be. I want to be more holy. I want to be closer to you. I want to make better choices for my family. I want to make better choices for my life for you, God. This is what I want to do, God. 
teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now listen. Again, I, I quote this book a lot. If you really want to be convicted, say, Pastor Matt, we, you know, we're convicted enough when we come here. And that's why we don't bring anybody with us. <laughs> All right. So, so bring some people with you. Um, and then I can scare them away. Um, this is Jonathan Edwards' Resolutions. It's out, I don't know if there's a few more copies out there in the bookstore. They're like, it's like five bucks. But uh, when, again, when you read this stuff, I say it all the time, there's a reason God used him to spark the first great awakening in this, in this country. Now it's interesting, what he talks about is not only the grace of God that has forgiven, to him, forgiven him, but the grace of God that empowers him. Look what he says. I'm going to read you a couple of his resolutions. Before that, in the intro, he says this, Being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace, listen, by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so far as they are agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. So he starts right off telling us, right, the grace of God has forgiven me and I can't do anything except for the grace of God. Understand? Now look what he resolves to do. You know, we have New Year's resolutions. You know, I want to lose a few pounds. You know, I want to go to the gym. I want to, you know, do some good spiritual. Day, all those things. This, these are things he resolved to do daily, monthly, yearly. Just listen to them. He says he can't do any of them without Christ's help and Christ's sake and Christ's enabling. I'm not going to read you all of them. I'm going to read a few of them. Well, because there's, there's, uh, there's a hundred of them, by the way. So... Resolved, if ever I shall fall and grow dull so as to neglect to keep in part any of these resolutions, to repent of all I can remember when I come to myself again, resolved never to do any manner of thing, listen to this, never to do any manner of thing, whether in soul or in body, less or more, but what tends to the glory of God, nor be, nor suffer it, or nor allow it, if I can possibly avoid it. He says, again, I'll interpret for you. I resolve to do every single thing in my life for the glory of God. Everything. Resolve never to lose, listen to this, now here's some of them. Resolve never to lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I possibly can. He was scrupulous about seconds, minutes, half hours, hours. He said he lived in, in, in such a way that I only have so much time to live. What am I doing with my time? Because I'm going to die one day. And he's going to say that. And, and, and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm resolved to live every moment of my life to the glory of God. Doesn't the Bible say that? Redeem the time. Right? Because the days are evil. Buy up your time. Redeem it. Do something with it for the glory of Jesus. Make a difference for God. Resolved to live with all my might while I do live. He says to live as hard as he can for the glory of God. Didn't want to be lazy. Didn't want to waste time. To resolve to live with all my might while I live. Resolve never to do anything that I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. How many times have we heard that? Well, I'm coming near the end now. Oh, I wish I did this and I wish I did that and I, and, and I wish I took this step for God and I, and, and I wish I served Him and, I, and I, 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 I wish I taught my kids more about I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. He's saying, I don't want to be that man. He's saying, I want to live now that way. Never to do anything that I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Resolved. To think, listen to this, resolve to think much on all occasions of my own dying and the common circumstances which attend death. He said he always wanted to think about the day he was going to die. See, that's, that's pretty morbid, right? No, but it's pretty serious. Pretty serious. Again, I, that's why I tell you, I go pray in the cemetery and I take my kids with me. And the... The gravekeeper over here in the, the cemetery, 
he see, you know, he sees me, you know, going in there with the Calvary Chapel truck, and he's like, here comes this nutcase again, praying in the cemetery. And now he's bringing in some of his kids with him. Okay. All right. But listen, I tell my kids, I tell them that daddy's going to be laying here one day. What are you going to say about me? I tell them that. Pastor Matt, that's morbid. You don't want to have them think about that. No, it's the truth. It's a fact. And, and, and I hope it sparks in them that they want to live for Jesus and they want to make their life count. Put Jonathan Edwards, resolve to think much on all occasions of my own dying in the common circumstances which attend death. Resolve to act in all respects, both, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I. Listen to this. This is really good for those of us who judge. I'll read it again. Resolve to act in all respects, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I, and as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others, and to let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God. You see what he said? Let me just break that down for you because I had to break it down for me. What he's saying is this. Resolve when my brothers and sisters are sinning and failing to look at them and say, you know what, I'm no better than them. That I'm, I'm worse than them. And I resolve to do that and to think on my own shame. See, if you think that way, you'll be able to help some people out and not break them down. Resolved, listen to this. When I feel pain, to think of the pains and martyrdom and of hell. He says, when I'm feeling pain, whether physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, to think of my brothers and sisters who are being martyred and think about those who went, went to hell and didn't have Christ. Man, that'll keep you going. Because our mind should go there. When we're struggling, you know, financially, physically, whatever it is, emotionally, to think, you know what? There are some of our brothers and sisters that have it a little worse than we do that are getting their heads sawn off right now. Remember a few months back, the, the 21 men on the beach that had their heads cut off. What about their wives and what about their kids? What about them? And what he's saying is I can suck it up a little longer. That's what he's saying. Resolved. When I think of any theorem in divinity to be solved, immediately to do what I can, can Toward solving it. If circumstances don't hinder, what he's saying here is to study my Bible and read my Bible and try, try to understand the deep things of God. Resolved. If I take delight in it as a gratification of pride or vanity or any such account, immediately to throw it by. He's saying, I keep short sin accounts with God. As soon as a moment of pride or vanity comes into my life, I confess it, I forsake it right away. Resolved. To be endeavoring to find out fit objects of charity and liberality. He says, I want to give away more and not take. And look for opportunities to do it. We look for opportunities to get around it sometimes. Resolved never to do anything out of revenge. Resolved. Never to suffer the least motions of anger to irrational beings. Resolve never to speak evil of anyone, so that shall it tend to his dishonor more or less upon no account except for some real good. He's saying when I talk about people, I don't want to gossip about them. I'm only going to talk about them if I want to build them up. Resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. And there's 88 more. But I read those and I'm, I'm convicted. Because you know what? Besides Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul, all the great giants of the faith, all the Jonathan Edwards, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther's, John Calvin's, the men in our day and age, this, they're sinful beings just like me and you. Their God is our God. And if they can do more for Jesus Christ, then we can do more for Jesus Christ. Because grace empowers you. Grace enables you. Titus. 
teaching us that denying, verse 12, ungodliness and worldliness, lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What else does grace do for us? It helps us look for his coming. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are we wanting Jesus Christ to come back? Do we want to see Jesus face to face? Or do we sit there and say, oh, I got this to do. I got a business to run for us. I got money to make for us. I got daughters to marry off and sons to marry off. I, God, you can't come now. I, I, I got stuff going on. You know, let me live till I'm 99, respectively healthy, and then just die in my sleep. <laughs> or do we say, surely, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Come back, Lord Jesus. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, please. <laughs> they believed he was coming in, in their day. We believe that he's coming in our day. Listen, I want to give you some quick signs to prove that he is coming soon. Luke 21, 31 says, When you see these things, know that it's near, that it's close, it's at the door. Wars and rumors of wars... Oh, listen, it's on a global scale. <laughs> that has never happened before. War on a global scale. Famines, earthquakes, pestilence, global scale. Many deceivers in the world, global scale. Israel's in the land. We've seen that. Increase wickedness, loss of love. I, I mean, if we don't see that, then we're, we're blind. Seriously, look at what's going on. Increase wickedness, loss of love. <laughs> Didn't you know when they, they passed the, you know, the gay marriage thing, don't you know it's right out there right now that they want to start implementing classes in the public school systems to teach those things in the, you know, you, I mean, are we not in the last days? And the Bible says the days will come when they'll call evil good and good evil. You're evil if you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You're evil if you believe in the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman. You're evil if you say those other things are sinful. You're evil. Sign that we're in the last days. Reemergence of demigods, fallen angels, demons, aliens. The Bible talks about this, that it's going to happen in the last days. Instead of turning to God with all the evidence that's around us. Listen, you, you know the lead in evolution is don't believe in evolution anymore, right? You know, just within the DNA, there's so much what the word I'm looking for is, but this, it's just so complex that they even say someone had to stop this. Someone a lot smarter than us. So instead of glorifying God, right, they worship the creature rather than the creator, which Romans 1 says that they'll do, and that's exactly what they do. And they say, hey, some alien, some life form, some this, some demigod, some, you know, that's how everything got started. Strong delusion, sign that we're in the last days. The emerging church, what's the emerging church? The emerging church is the church that says, hey, you know what? We don't have to stand on the Bible anymore. Let's just get people to come in. Let's just get them in from all walks of life. So you've got church leaders standing up on the, on the same platform with Muslim leaders Okay? And political leaders, let's just get them in. That happens now. Say, Pastor Matt, but they're just trying to show love. No, they're not. They're dumbing down the word of God. The Bible says love rejoices in the truth. It doesn't rejoice in error and in iniquity. Looking for that glorious appearing. Well, what about one world government? <laughs> no nation can make a decision anymore unless the whole world agrees to it. We certainly can't. We just go along with what everyone else is doing. Rise of an antichrist system. I think you can see it on the scene in the Middle East and the religion of Islam. You can get mad at me if you want, but that's what I think. What about technology to destroy and control the whole world. <laughs> That's on the scene. When the Bible says in Revelation, one quarter of the earth's population is going to be wiped out just like that, I, that can happen with the push of a button. 
Pastor Matt, yeah, that's doom and gloom type stuff. No, 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 listen. It, the Holy Spirit is just restraining that right now. Restraining that from happening. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Listen, who gave him, and we'll close with this, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Paul tells Titus, Titus, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. Titus, don't stop teaching these things. Don't stop telling people these truths. That grace forgives you, that grace empowers you, and that grace helps you look for the return of Jesus Christ. That's what grace does. He says, Titus, keep doing this. Because Jesus died for you, we forgave you of all your sins. He gave you eternal life. He gave you a purpose in this life. Now you should bring forth some fruit to God, he says. Your people in that church, Titus, should bring forth some fruit to God. Because look what he says. And purify unto himself, verse 14, a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now listen, those works we know don't save us. We just talked about that. Now listen, stay with me. I'll close with this. Those works we know don't save us. But those works that we do prove that we belong to him. Because you should want to do things for Jesus. You should want to. Because Jesus loved you and died for you. How can you not? It says what? Purify for himself a peculiar people. That's a separate, a distinct people. People should know that you belong to Jesus Christ. Listen, my wife yells at me all the time because I go to my son's baseball and football games. I got the Jesus shirt on. I got the Jesus hat on. And she goes, you're not acting like Jesus right now. Yelling at this and yelling at the umpires and you're not acting like... I'm like, well, that doesn't count when it comes to sports. <laughs> and then she goes, this is what she says to me. She says, well, then take the Jesus gob off. <laughs> well, she's right. But you know something? Because I'm zealous over that. Now listen, that's okay. And I'm zealous about the Patriots winning the Super Bowl. Listen, I don't think Tom Brady did anything wrong. <laughs> Seriously. Because I'm zealous that he's the best quarterback of all time. And I'll fight for that. But listen, how much more zealous should we be for the things of God? You know what zealous means? I looked it up. Fervent, ardent, fervid, fanatical, passionate, devout, devoted, committed, vigorous, intense, and energetic. That's what zealous means. We should be zealous for Jesus Christ. We should be zealous for the work of Jesus Christ. We should be zealous to bring forth fruit to God in our lives for the glory of God. Because our lives matter. Our lives count for time for eternity. And so many other people's out there, their lives don't count. And that's why we need to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, so many churches in, in this area, you know what they're made up of? All of all areas. They're made up of, you know, the same, whatever, how many thousand people? There's probably about 15,000, 20,000 people on the North Shore area, maybe a little less, that belong to Jesus. And the church is just made up of those people. Some go over there, then they'll go over there, then they'll come back over here, then they'll go over there, and they'll go. And that's okay. God moves them around to grow them. But I don't want that. I want there to be 50, 100,000, 200,000 people that are filling all the churches, and we have to make new ones for Jesus Christ. 